Good evening, friends. I am Dr. Ashok Loda, specialist pediatrician and specialist neonatologist at Bell Hall Specialty Hospital, Dubai, here, here in Dubai. I hope you all are healthy, fit, safe, and fine. Friends, today on my talk show, I thought of taking a topic uh, which is not so uncommon, but yet very intriguing. The moment that topic, that word comes to our mind, most of the non-medical persons, they have a strange kind of uh, creepy feeling. And that word, that topic is autism. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we have seen rising in the cases of autism. And people at large do have lots of myths, misconceptions, sometimes social stigma also, if someone in their family is suffering from autism. To, to throw more light on that, to clear all that haze and mist around autism in people's mind, I have invited on my talk show an authority, very knowledgeable person, and he who has an illustrious career, He's passionate about autism and developmental disorders in children in particular. He's none other than our friend, our academician, Dr. Samir Delwai. Now, just I will give a brief introduction about Dr. Samir Delwai. Dr. Samir is a pediatrician who is, who has, who is expert in development pediatrician. He is founder and director of... Uh, Child, uh, Horizons Child Development Center in Mumbai, in India, which is a very famous center since 2003. He's also attached to prestigious Nanavati Hospital, Hinduja Hospital, and Jaslok Hospital in Mumbai. He has also been awarded Rajiv Gandhi Manav Seva Award for Services in Children in 2012. And more than that, he, he himself is director of New Horizon Child Development Center. Now, this center is unique in a way that it has an interdisciplinary team of developmental pediatrician. And of course, Dr. Samir is heading that, uh, that, that pediatrician group. There are clinical and counseling psychologists, occupational and physical therapists, speech and language therapists, remedial educators, and nutritionists. So you can imagine all these faculties are available under one roof so that Children who are suffering from these development disorders do not have to run from pillar to post. So, Dr. Samir, welcome to my show. Hello. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Ashok. Yeah. Dr. Samir, you are very busy and still you have taken out time for our viewers. Let's straight away start bang on to the subject. Now, this autism, many parents, many viewers would like to know that what is autism? how common it is, and is there any epidemic of autism? Because of late, we have realized that um, there's a lot of buzz, a lot of discussion about autism. Is, is it rising? All right. So, uh, Dr. Ashok, like I said, thank you so much for having me on this show. And uh, I'm very happy to share whatever information, experience I can share with all our viewers here. I'll take your questions in the reverse order. Is there an epidemic? So we know typically it's not an, obviously it's not an infectious disorder, but yes, the, the numbers are on the rise. And that is also because of an increase in the awareness of the pediatricians in schools, in teachers, and even in parents in the ability to try and recognize that a child may have a problem of this sort. At the same time, I do think there is actually an increase in the absolute number of children having this problem as well. And we'll discuss the reasons for that later. You asked me about what do we think or what do we know about autism? So I'd like to start off with a disclaimer right at the beginning that most of what I'm going to talk about is going to be my experience and what I have seen as what we call as autism. Because if we read the books as we did when we were in our residency, when yeah. we read the definitions, it sounds like we have some neurological disorder. It's so difficult to understand. And that's why you said it's such a tragic word that we you know, kind of don't know what it means. Unfortunately, uh, I don't think we have done enough to clear this misconception around it. Correct. So we know that autism is defined and it's a genetic condition. It's because of a genetic predisposition and it's at the same time, it's epigenetic. It's a neurodevelopmental disorder in which there are impairments mm -hmm. in two the parts of the child. One is the social communication domain and the other is repetitive restrictive behaviors. Now, when you say this, nothing much can be understood. So I'll try and simplify in terms of what I think I look at it as. Yeah. 
the concept that we have to understand is what is normal social uh, communication development before we look at something which is abnormal. As we understand, every child once he is born, on day one of your life, you really don't know anything when you open your eyes or when you hear. It's all noise to you and it's all just pictures in front of you. Yeah. You start relating things. But the only thing that stands by you or is your instinct at that time is a survival instinct. So you, the baby cries when the baby is hungry. When the baby cries, nothing in front of the baby moves except one entity. Well, we know the entity is perhaps the mother who picks up the child and feeds. Mm -hmm. Over a period of time when the child cries again and again and he realizes that it's only one entity in the world around me that comes to my aid or helps me and feeds me and makes me feel better. Over a period of days, a child realizes that the world around it has two parts. One part that interacts with it and helps it and benefits it. And the other part that couldn't care less, which is non-interactive and inert. And therein lies the concept of the human child understanding the fact that I can interact or engage with some entities in the world, which obviously we know now or later are living beings or humans. And there are some, uh, some entities with which we cannot really interact. They are inert. So we know that that is the object world or they are the objects. Yeah. Obviously, over a period of time, the child pays more and more attention and engages more and more with the interactive bit. That is the humans because that's where all the support and the care is coming from. And while doing that, the child starts observing the way humans behave and interact with each other. This form of behavior, like people comb their hair, they wear clothes, they yeah. eat food from a plate, they have a bath in a shower. He observes all this. Over a period of time, he also gets smarter. And he learns that, well, different people wear different kinds of clothes. So yeah. they're not all the same. Different people comb. The father may not have much hair to comb, but the mother may do an elaborate job of it. Yeah. So he gets smarter in understanding human behaviors. Then he realizes the further nuances that the mother behaves differently when maybe her own sister is there, but her behavior kind of changes when maybe the mother-in-law or somebody, uh, some other stranger comes into the room. He also notices that the mother's behavior or the father's behavior is different when there are no guests in the house. But if there is some stranger, suddenly the behavior will change. So all this the child is observing that people eat food in a plate, people dress, people comb their hair. All these are normal human social behaviors. Animals don't have this. So the child has to learn this by observation. And this is happens in the very few first months of life. By the time the child is eight, nine months of age, he also realizes that people connect to each other mm -hmm. by yeah. facial expressions. By yeah. So he starts picking up non-verbal communication where people give signals and messages to each other. And over a period of time, again, by the time the child is one, one year, two months, three months, he realizes that just like this is a physical symbol. This is not just a waving of the hand. This is a physical symbol indicating I'm going away. He also realizes there is a sound in the air, which is bye-bye. When I do this, bye-bye or ta-ta. Yeah. So the child realizes just like there is a physical symbol to communicate something, which is non-verbal communication. There can also be verbal communication, which is nothing but speech. Mm. So all of this are gained by the child nor in the normal development by exposure and interaction with the environment. So yeah. I have put it down in a sequence. Mm -hmm. And I call it the communi social communication sequence, okay. where the first step is social interaction, engagement. Mm -hmm. The second six milestone is learning social behaviors. The third is learning nonverbal communication. And then finally, the fourth is verbal. But in a child who has a genetic predisposition towards developing autism, we have seen that the first step itself is impaired. Okay. So the child does not pick up that difference between living and non-living does not have that ability to interact to and fro, engage to and fro with people as much as a child who's typically developing. Now, what we must understand is this is a flaw in the first step of the sequence or in the first milestone. So if this doesn't get picked up, the remaining milestones are not going to get picked up. So obviously this child who is not engaging or interacting will not learn consequentially normal human behaviors. That's why he will not learn normal non-verbal communication. And that's why he will fail to learn and pick up speech. So not picking up speech is a consequence. Oh. But the first clinical problem that happens is lack of interaction. Oh. And why I'm saying this is very important because very often what is picked up 95% of the parents who come to my clinic come for the complaint of child not speaking yeah. because that's what we notice. Yeah. But the mistake is to start with speech. 
Mm-hmm. Don't try to get the child to speak. It's like a child who's not even sitting, but is two years old, who should have been walking by now. You try to directly get him to walk. That's not common sense. It tells us it's not possible. So this is why we must understand where the first clinical step goes wrong. You take the first wrong turn and then you are on the wrong road all through. Unless you go back to that first wrong turn you took, you are not going to get back on track. And the other thing that happens when you have this genetic predisposition is, if you are not going to engage with humans, whom are you going to engage with? So if you see the objects around us are multifold number of times in the people. So this child starts engaging or paying that much attention to objects. Now all objects around us are arranged in patterns and those patterns are rigid and fixed. These are the other two things that define an object. It's a pattern and the pattern is fixed. So the child who picks up normal, typically the nuances of social behavior and social communication. In this case, he is an expert at picking up the nuances of patterns. So he would be very good at any kind of pattern. So if he hears A, B, C, D, it's a sound pattern to him. He will be able to repeat A, B, C, D. If he hears the words mama, mama, mama again and again and again, or dada, 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 it's a pattern to him. He doesn't understand that he's expressing it by calling out to the mother as mama. For him, it's just a pattern. So he'll say to the mother, to the father, to the aunt, to the wall, to the door, everything. Similarly, if he hears a nursery rhyme or a school rhyme, it's a pattern to him. He may hear a prayer. That's a pattern to him. He may learn the rhymes and he may repeat that. Now, what confuses us is, look, this child is speaking. But that's not speech. That's echolalia, but that's basically repetition. Because this child is brilliant at patterns. You write A to Z. I had a child who came to me once. He would write A to Z. So I said, write L. Again, you would start with A, B, C, D. Okay, write P, A, B. So for him, it's a pattern. It's a design. And that's why you have children with autism who would be great musicians or even mild autism, but they could be great economists. Because Mm. just as they have a problem with social communication development, they have a great predilection for patterns. But the problem here is patterns are rigid. For example, I gave you when the normal typical developing child sees his parents behave differently with him when they are alone and says the behavior change when a relative or a guest comes in. Mm. Here, The pattern, when the parents change, their shirt pattern or the buttons of their (laughs) shirt doesn't change. Mm. Here the child is like that. His behavior will be the same always because objects don't change. The patterns don't change. He becomes rigid. Whereas the guy who's typically developing social human, uh, uh, human social communication is adept at change and dynamism. I mean, the best example of it would be a politician or a diplomat. He would enter a room and he would know what to say. He yes. will go to the next room and say exactly the opposite thing in like two seconds. Yeah. So his social communication is developed to that extent. Hmm. This is the opposite in a child with autism. Hmm. He would be very, very poor at this. He would do the same thing over and over everywhere else. But he would be brilliant at picking up patterns. Unfortunately, and this is a very big statement that I'm making. I could be wrong, but I believe this very thing. Unfortunately, the repetitive part or the patterned expert is a child, which is I consider a problem is actually in a way exploited by many of us mm. because then we teach the child nursery and say, hey, look, I taught your child to speak. We teach the child to copy ABCD. Hey, look, oh. I taught your child to write. Yeah. This unfortunately takes up the first two years are gone because we don't realize anything. The mm. next two years are gone because we are only telling, teaching the child to mimic speech and mimic designs while write, reading and writing. By the time the child is six years old, he's going to a school with a bunch of unknown children, he doesn't know what to do where, much less what to speak where, what sets in his anxiety. And that reinforces his repetitive behavior. And that's what you have as an autism spectrum disorder. Oh, so viewers, you must have realized in uh, 10, 15 minutes how passionate, how much knowledgeable Dr. Samir is. Uh, Uh, You just have lots of words of wisdom. So much information. Sometimes you need time to grasp and understand sorry it. i was if i was a little <laughs> yeah. quick but we can do this no, no, uh, again fair enough, fair enough. we could understand that um, the important thing most of us even um, healthcare professionals or general pediatricians also focus a lot on speech but dr samir is emphasizing speech is later on the sequence the, the initial thing yeah. is to catch them much early the social That's part it. yeah so can you explain slightly again that that part for the parents that okay. won't wait for speech 
to be detected that how how early and what red flags they should uh, take into mind good very good question so we, i've explained the concept now i'll explain the red flags as uh, dr yeah. ashok sir said a child with autism would not have a very early social smile or a good eye contact yeah. but we must remember what we mean by eye contact so yeah yeah i'm staring into your eyes but this is not good eye contact this is meaningless so if i look at my ah okay a smiling response of a child mm -hmm. in response to a pleasant familiar stimulus every word is important the response it's a yeah, response yeah. dr samir i think for few seconds there was some internet uh, uh, problem can you repeat last two three sentences okay. starting from the yeah. from the eye to eye contact this concept is yeah. very important right so when i just do this i'm staring in your eyes but this is not good eye contact because it is meaningless mm. but when i look at my mother or a person whom i have an attachment with and i'm happy and i express that by smile that's a good eye contact and social smile ah, okay. so social smile is defined as a smiling a smile in response to a pleasant familiar stimulus Yeah. every word is important the fact that it's a response mm -hmm. is very important mm -hmm. so if i'm looking at the wall and smiling yeah. it's not yeah. social smile right if i have a kind of a villainous guy like some very scary person coming in front of me and i'm smiling that's not normal correct yeah but in it has to be a response to a pleasant and a familiar stimulus mm -hmm. so it is more here mm -hmm. than here or here True. it is more here Yeah. That is what we have to understand. So the child will have delayed or impaired eye, meaningful eye contact. Will have impaired social smile. Mm -hmm. Going on ahead, we know that the child, when the mother calls out, the child starts at least looking in her direction, starts responding when he hears the mother's sound. Mm -hmm. This child will not respond so much. Mm -hmm. Then the child starts recognizing his own name because he knows when he hears that sound, say Ashish. Okay, every time they say Ashish and they look at me, perhaps that's what they. that's what i'm supposed to look back and smile for so yeah. the child start associating this a child with autism because he is not engaged he will not do that going ahead the child responds with good non verbal communication yeah. if you wave the child will look at you understand and wave and very important cuddle hug you know you put out your hands like shahrukh khan's favorite style <laughs> so the child also put out his hands to hug you back yeah this to and fro reciprocity we hear this word in the textbooks very often but difficult to understand so i'm explaining it in a simpler way this mm -hmm. reciprocity is a ashok bhai you're smiling at me i'm going to smile back at you yeah. Yeah. so you know this is what is missing and the child does not have these big hugs or big smiles when the mother may come back from work or whatever there is no great change in this baby's demeanor because there is no interaction at all whereas a child who is typically developing will hug the mother run to meet the mother may cry when the mother is going away all these are red flags which are not there in a child with autism there won't be there'll be delayed understanding of non verbal communication mm. and there will be of course a delay in speech the important point parents must note here is the child may, you know there's this whole concept around 33% one third of autism being regressive autism that the child was developing normally and then he regressed mm -hmm. i i i haven't seen 34 33% children regress for sure maybe 2 or 3% in my practice okay. so what is this great big 30% that we say no my child was developing normally and then he regressed very often what we fail to take is a very good history and that's what the pediatricians yes. need to do mm -hmm. the history is the question we ask is was your child speaking well, the mother not her fault at all would say yes he was speaking what was he saying so he was saying mama at one year he was saying dada you have to ask very clearly as a clinician would the child look at you yeah would have an intention to connect with you for some reason for some purpose and meaningfully say the sound mama to you yeah we ha does he have any benefit to gain from it does he have a purpose if not if he is blankly saying mama and he, like i said to you to the father to the wall to the refrigerator to the toy then it's not a meaningful word mm -hmm. so for a sound to become a word there are three categories that i put to it or three definitions the sound has to have be used interactively it has to use meaningfully mm. and it has to use purposefully for it to become a word 
For example, maybe in some part of the world, we say mama to the mother. In Maharashtra, for example, we say I. Now you may not understand what I means. Yeah. For you, it's sound. Mm. You may not use the word I to your mother. In maybe Maharashtra, they may not use the word mama. They use the word mama for maternal uncle. Correct. So yes. the meaning of that sound is what I meant. Whether you say I to the mother or you say mama to the mother. And the third part is purpose. Am I calling out to my mother with a purpose of drawing her attention or getting something to eat? Now, if this is absent, what's happening is just meaningless repetition in the patterned way that I told you. And that often fools us that the child was doing well otherwise. Yeah. There are many children, most of them, who develop normal physical milestones like sitting, standing, walking. But lack of social and communication milestones are important. And then this child is more engrossed in himself. Yeah. Actually, he's engrossed in objects. But we think he's engrossed in himself. He's all the time engrossed in patterns and objects and parents will tell you, he knows exactly doctor while coming to your clinic to take a right turn or a left turn. He knows exactly how to use a mobile. Mm -hmm. He can know how to press the buttons on a remote. Anything which is a pattern and is to do with an object, the child will be extra brilliant at, whereas will be lacking behind. So both these things parents need to notice. Finally, if there's a doubt, nothing like consulting an expert and mm -hmm. your pediatrician. That's very important. Yeah. So we were even uh, lots of words of wisdom. Dr. Samir clearly told that uh, it's not mere staring and having eye to eye contact or babbling some words. There has to be a purpose and a meaning to that verb, uh, to word, verbal or non-verbal communication. That's the catch thing, which even I would admit that most of the pediatrician uh, forget that concept. We have read it, but we don't practice. So as a parent, Please understand there has to be a purpose and a meaning to both verbal and non-verbal communication. If that is missing, then perhaps you should take an opinion from an expert. Dr. Samir also brought out one interesting concept of uh, the well-developed some kind of pattern in these children. So uh, do these autistic children have some level of intellectual disability or some domain of the brain are extraordinarily developed, which uh, we can work on that further in their life. All right. So that's a good question. When we talk about intellectual disability, what we talk about basically is not just the IQ, but it's adaptability, whether the child can adapt to the situation and the surroundings. So because they, these children have a problem with social communication, they obviously would have a problem with adapting. Yeah. But intellectually per se, they might be very good at doing things which are patterned, like I explained to you. So they will be very good at something that they have, they have observed in their own and they are seen. Mm -hmm. Now, if it is something that is beneficial in the human life, yeah. obviously you will be appreciating it. Like for example, many parents appreciate that my child is able to use a, uh, you know, mobile phone or a gadget. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, well, it does show intelligence because you're able to understand how to figure out those numbers and the buttons. Mm -hmm. But the trouble is, if the child gets engrossed too much in the patterns, that is going to keep him further away from social interaction. Mm. So when I say that this was a genetic thing, what meant probably we meant was that basically the child lacks the potential of social interaction as much as another typically developing child, mm. which means that those of us who lacked it partially, but got a lot of it from our environment from day one of life, we were able to catch up. It's like a malnourished child or a low birth weight child. You get good nourishment. You will pick up. I'm comparing it to the same model. And I mean, these are all my observations. Mm -hmm. So you can take it as this is my thing. So I mean, there's no book which publishes this so far. We need to study this. But this is what I've observed in 18 years. So basically, when you ask why is this epidemic increasing? Well, let's look at the way society has changed. Mm -hmm. A couple of decades or even three decades back, one generation back, the genes were always there. This is not a new gene. Some ah. mutate, of course, are mutated, but these are thousands of year old genes. Mm -hmm. But a generation or two back, there were so many people around the baby. There was so much of social interaction that even if ah. the child, because of his genes, partially lacked social communication, nobody would leave that little baby alone. Everybody would keep talking to the baby aunts at home, uncles at home, cousins, brothers, everybody. So that prevented or that helped the child to gain a little bit of social interaction right from day one of life. Mm -hmm. And then gradually as he gained that, maybe he was a little late at social behavior, maybe a little late at speech, but he did catch up. And then maybe throughout his life, 
he was a little poor at social interaction so maybe he was a little absent minded genius cousin of ours maybe he was an absent minded <laughs> professor who would not speak much mm. or maybe he was that cousin who went on to become a big scientist or he was a great engineer or a doctor he wasn't really the jolliest person in the family but he did very well okay. today the child lacks the exposure because it's become like a the families have become nuclear mm. and on the other hand the child is given a device at birth yeah. i have seen children <laughs> as young as 3 month old uh. i'm not kidding you 3 month old babies being given tablets to watch yeah. nursery rhymes yeah. on so that they eat so the, as it is this child had a little less potential for social interaction now even that's gone there are not many people around and he's on the tablet so he's not even going to look at that time when the mother or father may be around and for this again i think it's very important to understand not to blame the mother because i've seen in our part of the world it's all comes down to the mother the yeah. mother has to be the wife also she has to be the daughter in law also she has to cook food also she has to work also she has to look after the house and see that the child doesn't use the mobile that's not going to happen it's a, equally the responsible of the responsible father the parents the in laws the and it's the neighbors the society all of us need to help children develop we cannot outsource it to the mother only that she has to do all of it because the child needs so much of because see even if he pays attention to the mother is only going to pick up one style of social communication yes so true he needs to develop learn from everybody else yeah so this is extremely important that we engage the child right from the child the time the children are born and we make sure that the child gets to interact with as many people as possible yeah so well said yeah uh, earlier the joint family concept was there so so many social interaction stimulus were given to the child correct and you rightly uh, brought up this subject of screen time the uh, tablets and mobiles and all uh, nowadays there is e learning digital learning at home most of us even children we all are now also we are looking at the screen so we just yes. can't avoid this part so uh, any any message for the uh, parents of the uh, parents of the autistic child whether this excess screen time will trigger or help or deteriorate their uh, symptoms or signs okay so it's very important to understand what causes the problem again i'll say this very humbly the basic step that goes wrong is only one step and that is the step of social interaction mm -hmm. because social interaction the child doesn't learn 100% the next step in the sequence learning social behaviors the child doesn't learn 100% maybe he learn only 40 70% mm -hmm. the next step is non verbal communication so because the earlier step is not very good non verbal may be only 40% yeah. and because of that the verbal can be only 20% so sure enough children will improve but make sure that you start at the bottom floor or the ground floor mm -hmm. make sure that the child gets plenty of social interaction becomes good at social interaction then make sure you use or make sure that you get your child involved in day to day activities at home i spend a lot of time with my patients just explaining them get your child to work with you in the house yeah. get your child involved to do household chores not because you need somebody to help you but because that is where the social interaction and communication the child picks up very often what happens is we directly pack him away to an institute or to a doctor or yeah. to a whatever yeah that it will help the child learn but it will be only in the it like everybody does well when they come to my clinic but he may not do anything in his house there's no use yeah there's no point my therapist or my therapy team getting the child to do everything in my clinic and he can't do anything at home it's very important that he learns to do at home so make the child do everything that happens in the house regularly that will get him to learn social behavior automatically i'm using the word automatically he will pick up non verbal communication and verbal communication as well you do not need to specifically there is no paralysis here that yeah. you need to give some exercises it's here he needs to understand why to communicate and how to connect he will find out the words on his own gradually of course you need a lot of therapy you need a lot of help for this but remember the sequence after the speech then comes reading and writing because when i know hey this is an apple i know the sound apple in my mind there's an image of the apple then somebody tells me hey listen when you need to write to somebody who's not in front of you i mean you write on a piece of paper right that's how it was invented so yeah. we break down the sound apple into a concept mm. of alphabets and phonemes and then we say a p p l e this is a concept it's an abstract concept 
Mm-hmm. How can you build up on an abstract concept unless the concrete is there? If the okay. child doesn't understand what apple is, how can you say teach the child A for apple, B for bat? What are you talking about? Yeah. Alphabets come later after you already have good verbal communication. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, very often it is thought that if we teach if the child learns A for apple, B for bat, it's a pattern. He doesn't understand how to use it. Yeah. So I would say go slow. Your child will learn everything. But don't jump the sequence because you can't bypass any step of the sequence. And when it comes to learning online, so parents tell me, you know, from uh, cartoons, he's picking up words. My suggestion is he's picking up words from cartoons, but he's also picking up cartoon behavior from cartoons. Yeah. You don't want him to behave like a cartoon. You watch the cartoon, shut it, and you behave like a cartoon. You jump up and down, you dance, you do whatever the cartoon is doing. So let the child's attention get focused away from the object up to you. Yeah. You cannot be the serious CEO or the great doctor in your house. <laughs> you have to be like a three-year-old kid. I yeah. call this joker therapy. If you are like a joker, the child will look at you. If yeah. you are boring, you prefer to look at the door. Yeah. So you need to be very interactive. You need to be very engaging. I tell people to look at the, this movie called Patch Adams. He goes around wearing this red bulb on his nose like a clown. Everybody likes to see it. He brings yeah. a laughter to everybody. Children look at him. So be very interactive with your child. It's not the screen that is going to get it. Screen is eventually an object. And yeah. the child will get fixated on using the screens. Yeah. I would say, please stop it. And you interact with the child and get the child absorbed in your world and build up the child's social interaction. Once the door is open, he walks through and he observes everything and he picks up everything. But the door is closed. That's social interaction. That's the first step. You need to get that open. Yeah, so well said. But due to these uh, unprecedented Corona time, uh, all the more children are, many of them are not going to school. So they are willingly or unwillingly deprived of the social interaction. And on top of that, parents, if they give some screen on their hands, children are bound to suffer from social interaction. So as Dr. Samir is clearly saying, don't let the child in you die, even if you are CEO or doctor. Yeah. With kid, you, you become kid. You do all uh, very well said. You become cartoon. Don't don't bother uh, that uh, uh, it's beyond my dignity, beyond my profession. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you have to kill your inner that um, inhib- inhibitory impulse of yes. and that will work magic for the children. Dr. Well Sandeep, another point is: uh, Do these children who are having autism, the regular schools, uh, will they take them up? They can be enrolled, or there are some special schools. Can you throw some light on that? Okay, so it all depends on what is a school taking in the child. It requires a particular level. Like, for example, junior kg somewhere would require the child to be able to speak so that it can teach the child further. So there's always an intake criteria for the syllabus. And then you build up on that. So there's a sequence there too. So if your child is not conversing or doesn't have verbal development, then he's going to find it difficult to pick up reading and writing. That's what I explained earlier. Okay. So it's the question is not whether you should put your child in a regular school or in a special school. Mm-hmm. The question should be at what level of development is my child and what is the level of uh, development that is expected for this syllabus or for this class. Okay. If they match that, see, it's a child is no problem. Mm-hmm. Suppose a child has never gone to school. Mm-hmm. He has stayed in some back of beyond. Directly is now eight years old. Can you directly put him in class four somewhere? Yeah. It's not possible because he's not to that level. So you need to look at your child's developmental level, not the age. Because obviously he's lagging behind his uh, development. So don't just go by the age. And okay, my child is four years old. He can't go to the junior kid. I have to put him in special school. No, that's not the concept. The concept is in the first two years of life, you need to work with a developmental team of pediatricians and therapists yeah. and a team to understand these concepts and whatever the child is lacking, with your help as parents, because you can yeah. do the most. In fact, now, because of this COVID situation, our centers are all shut down. But mm-hmm. we've worked with parents, coaching them on an online yeah. online interactive program, and it's working wonders. There were children who were coming to the center and not doing so well. <laughs> because I think perhaps parents thought that, okay, we are doing therapy three days a week. That's great. No. Yeah. Now, when they are coaching the parents, they are doing this 24 hours. And the child is doing so much better. So, in fact, I've become converted more to this online interactive kind of coaching yeah. of parents because it's working very well. And just to come back, uh, Dr. Ashok, to what you said about uh, this COVID times. 
So in fact, now like on Zoom, we are interacting. Mm. So as long as I can see the child can see a normal human being or animals, mm. it's okay. The problem is with animation and with games yeah. and hearing the same repetitive nursery rhymes again and again. Mm. So I tell parents that I understand you can't go out and meet uncles and aunts. Have a you know call like we are having now, but yeah. don't put it on the mobile phone. The trouble is once a child gets a gadget and buttons in his hands, he is not going to give it to you. I tell parents try and switch your WhatsApp, uh, the whatever communication you have, to the television or at least yeah. to the laptop. Yeah. So the child can't press buttons. Sure. Then you can have you know there are people whose parents are in another country. Yeah. I'm very happy to say that please let put them on the TV yeah. all day. I mean grandparents often are free. Let them be on the TV. Let the child keep interacting with them on the TV. But you can see, like I can see you, you can yeah. see me clearly. Yeah. So it's not the screen only. It's what yeah. is being shown through the screen that's important. Hey, Dr. Samir is an encyclopedia. You really have so many pearls of wisdom. Such a simple and small thing he told viewers that uh, uh, he's not against interacting on, on WhatsApp or Zoom, but he, he's telling clearly not on the mobile because otherwise the control is in hands. In absolutely. his hands, child's hands. The control should be in your hands. Your hands, absolutely. Your hands, yeah, that is such a simple, important thing. And other thing is, um, Dr. Samir's this. Um, he they have because of this COVID time. No, he told rightly that because of some um, some you know, some children might want some sessions and they can't come physically to their center. So in their center, they have this online intervention and counseling service for children and uh, parents. So this is. Uh, add on benefit they have started in their center and of course uh, there's no geographical boundaries anyone in the world can access this service yeah so uh, a few more questions which parents often think that um, is there any test because you have told us pointers red flags soft subtle signs still some of the parents uh, may not be that much perceptive or understanding to pick up those signs or for that matter, even general pediatricians also would like to know, is there any test to diagnose or it is purely a clinical catch? Uh, well, I would say it's clinical, but there is a very good tool, which is a screening test, which was developed by Dr. Simon Baron Cohen in uh, Cambridge. And it's available for free. I would recommend all my pediatrician yeah. uh, friends on your mobile. You just, you know, uh, uh, look for M chat online. And you can use it hundreds of times. Every patient uh, you get, you can use it. It takes about five minutes. And you know, you're on your phone, you just ask the parent questions and you can write and you get a score at the end. Yeah. And you get a risk evaluation depending on the age of the child. You oh. can use this test as early as 16 to 17 months, even up maybe 15, 18 months for sure. And you can use it up to 30 months as a rough guideline. So at least it helps you explain to the parent what's happening. But I would have a very, uh, you know, uh, a request to the pediatricians or to the clinicians. What happens is unfortunately this word autism has got a very, very bad stigma and a bad connotation yeah. to it. Yeah. And that's largely been because we've not really understood what it is. Correct. In fact, like I said, the word, I'll just take one more minute, Dr. Yeah, sure, the sure. word autism yeah. was coined by Dr. Leo Kanner in 1943 in uh, John Hopkins. In Hindi or Marathi, when we translate this word, the word has been translated as Swa Magna. In Sanskrit, basically, Swa Magna. 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 Up, involved, up name involved. So it's a wrong translation. Ah, okay. The word autism doesn't mean Swa Magna. It doesn't mean self involved. So I always ask the parents, I mean, Gautam Buddha was self involved or the <laughs> Rishi Munis, because then you are, you are journey yeah. within yourself. That's yeah. not what this child is doing. Yeah. What Kanner used the word autism for was coming from within. Mm. Autos is self. Same. He didn't say self-involved. He said it is coming from within mm. and used that word because his challenge was to differentiate it from childhood schizophrenia. Oh, okay. So he has said schizophrenia is developed or you know acquired rather. Mm. But there has been a normal development and then you acquire schizophrenia as an mm. adult. Mm -hmm. So even in childhood schizophrenia, it is a few years of normal development and then the child develops those features. He said autism is from the beginning of life. Oh. It is coming from within the child and it is from beginning of life. That is why I use the word autos he used. Mm. But actually, if you want to use it, it's not swamagna. I use the word vastu magna or object involved. Yeah, yeah. 
and yeah. human less involved hmm. now this sounds very maybe down market doesn't sound like it's come from harvard yeah. but it tells a parent what is going wrong yeah. and it empowers a parent True. when i use a high sounding word like autism spectrum right. disorder i can charge high fees because it's like a fancy title that i'm giving <laughs> when i use a simp but the parent can't do anything he gets scared because he doesn't know what to do about it when i tell him that look your child has a deficiency Hmm. in terms of social interaction logon ke sath i mean uh, interacting with people he has a little deficiency hmm. and he has an overdose of interacting or being involved with objects object what will you do so the parents say doctor that's so easy hmm. we will increase his interaction with humans and yeah. we will decrease his uh, you know exposure to yeah. objects so well done that's a good starting point hmm. i'm not saying that's the end of it but it yeah. takes away the fear from parents yeah. and that is our first duty as doctors to do not to scare the parents and you're not lying you're telling them the truth because right. they can see it the moment you tell them this most of the mothers will say that's right that's exactly what my kid is doing yeah. i think that so if that, we put it in this way it helps the parents yeah that's precisely the purpose of calling you and inviting you on my talk show to spread the awareness that <clears throat> don't be scared of the word autism uh as dr samir has said it is a genetic predisposition and don't feel guilty especially the mothers that she did well and there was some fault in the grooming so this is the usual story most of them blame it on rio blame it on uh, mother it's so simple and easy and that uh, another question is coming to my mind that uh, about the genetic predisposition if uh, there's one autistic child in the family and mother wants to have second baby she wants to get pregnant um is, is there any risk of recurrence in the yes. uh, next siblings yes so uh, we all know that now the, uh, the the incidence of prevalence of autism is about almost 1 and 1/2 to 2% in the normal population so that is the risk everybody has but if you already have a child with a known diagnosed autism spectrum mm-hmm. disorder it's 10 times more in the next baby okay uh, that that definitely so it tells us that it has a genetic predisposition when we say this we don't know exactly which gene causes that yeah. there are many genes which are associated with it so nowadays we have a gene panel and all that yeah. but the single most recognized cause is fragile x so if you have another child in the family or if you have a history of repeated miscarriages or a bad obstetric history amongst the family members then it's very important to understand that the we need to do a test for fragile x which is not very expensive at all Yeah. many children not many but some children with down syndrome exhibit autism so the most single most recognized cause is fragile x so you may if there is a dysmorphology or there is a strong family history you yeah. would recommend a fragile x uh, test for the family also like we mentioned about m chat that is a screening tool yeah. so then and if that comes positive then you don't need to have a diagnosis to start working and intervening with a child with autism certainly you don't need anything in your own house and when you ask me about the second child Yeah. i would tell the mother that yes but i would still tell them that it's a risk there are some genes we can test when the lady is pregnant yeah and if we find the same gene sequence in the previous child mm. one of the parents and the new you know the unborn child yeah. then we know that this yeah. child is definitely at risk yeah but if you are not able to do all these tests mm-hmm. i would suggest that you go ahead and take the chance yeah. but you know right from the beginning what to yeah. work on from the one of your child yeah keep the mobile survey keep a large part of the objects and toys away and interact with your baby keep speaking yeah. keep having fun keep kissing the baby hug the baby cuddle the baby tickle the baby you know do it everything old fashioned how the grandparents used to do you need to like you mentioned don't have that you know inhibition yeah. just be have like a child that would help and of course then there are many tests that we as developmental pediatricians would do and there are assessments but i don't you know that's not for to worry the parents about that that any good so i would only say be sure you go to a certified practitioner who is with a team because no one doctor yeah. not me not anybody else can give you all the solution you need to have people who work in a team, team yeah. with each other always ask for credentials look at the certification that you see yeah. and very important ask for documentation ask for reports because when i sign below a paper mm-hmm. i think twice about what i am you know diagnosing or yeah. advising before i sign so make sure you get reports from the experts yeah very well said yeah uh still uh, there are many parts of the world perhaps in india and some families also they still consider it as a social stigma once they come to know that their child is autistic despite awareness despite so much of information availability 
deep down in their heart, the initial feeling is of denial or rejection. And uh, more than themselves, they are worried about people around them, the, the school, what will Exactly. Be. Yeah. So is there any message, some uh, tips you can give to, to overcome this social stigma part? Yes. Uh, as I said again, and as you rightly said, it has to do with the other people rather than the parents themselves. Yeah. It's a society that needs to understand this. And hence, I don't see none of us have the same social behavior or capabilities. Like I mentioned, the politician would go for, to a room full of people and know what to say and would go to another room and know to say exactly the other thing. So he is highly endowed on social communication. Mm -hmm. Whereas some of us would be not so highly uh, endowed in terms of communication, you know, or social, we would be okay, this is the way I am and I prefer to be this way. Got so it. it's a spectrum of which I call human spectrum. It's not mm -hmm. an autism spectrum. Yeah. Autism spectrum is a small part of it, mm -hmm. which is labeled. So mm -hmm. our uh, philosophy is from label to enable. Mm -hmm. Don't bother yeah. too much about the labeling. Yeah. Enable the child. And yeah. to enable the child, you need to understand where things started going wrong. Just sure. correct them and things will improve. And society should know that all of us are in a spectrum. All Some of us have a big nose, some of us have a small yeah. nose, some of yeah. us have a funny voice. Yeah. It's part of nature to have diversity. It's yeah. part of nature. There are children, there are people with autism who have, have the biggest inventions in the world, who have been the biggest musicians, who have been the biggest mathematicians, yeah. who have been the biggest scientists. So they have, if they would not have been there with their phenomenal attention to patterns and repetitive patterns, we would not have had this great expertise in physics and uh, yeah. you know, perhaps uh, engineering and economics. So we need to understand that diversity drives the world ahead and we need all kinds of diverse people around. Yeah. So it's important for your child, let me say this very clearly, if your child is so-called typically developing, mm. it is important for him to see a child who is not typically developing, mm. that is going to teach your child how to adapt to that child. Yeah. Your child is benefiting. So, so don't do this of telling the school that look we don't want that child coming to our school yeah. because he is a bad influence on our kids, not at all. Mm. Your child is getting an additional benefit of learning how to develop himself, yeah. adapt himself to deal with that other child. Yeah. So be accepting of diversity. Mm -hmm. The history of the world is replete with stories of disasters and wars when we try to be too narrow focused on yeah. these are my people or my kind of people. That is the yeah. worst thing mankind can do. Accept everybody. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Samir is really For your own good. philosophical <laughs> zone and orbit which makes sorry, sorry, logical yeah. sense. No, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, people do correlate. People do connect with what you're talking about. And so it's an important thing. The, what, the child who is specially able, he's doing a favor to other child who is perhaps developing normally and he's helping him to to improve his adaptability quotient or ratio or whatever you call Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, uh, in, in general, generally speaking, in, in life, we always say that we should uh, know ours and others' uh, uh, strengths and weaknesses and work on that. And exactly. so in the case with this autistic child, parents or the people around them or the teachers or further down in their career, they should work on their strength rather than weakness. Weakness is social interaction, but they must have, may have some intellectual strength. I think uh, I um, some people have them great mathematical ability. If you remember that Rain Man, Dustin Hoff, yeah. Hoffman picture, so uh, doesn't fit exactly into um, yeah. That brings to uh, one question in my mind: Is autism and autism spectrum disorder same, or it is a part of that? If you can throw some light for the uh, yeah common people. So autism spectrum disorder is now the terminology used by the American Academy of Psychiatrists, Association of Psychiatrists in their DSM-5. So there is a big umbrella term and hence words like autism or uh, PDD, NOS, that pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, Red syndrome or and Asperger syndrome, all these terms have been taken away and now it's under one umbrella called autism spectrum disorders. Mm. So it's just a terminology. Ah. Autism is a, you know, one part of that terminology, yeah. but the actual medical terminology now to be used for certification, etc. is autism spectrum disorder. But colloquially, we do use the word autism. Yeah. Okay, fine. Um, since we are talking of genetics and future pregnancy, uh, there is some talk in, in the medical circle about stem cell therapy. 
Um, and yeah, before I forget the uh, link of MMR vaccine with the autism, if you can tell something. So enough research has been done and proven that there is no link between autism and any of the vaccines. And this is what you and I have both read yeah. and even Lancet, we do that article. Yeah. This is in the common realm. But I'd like to just say, if you permit my two cents of understanding yeah. to this thing. Yeah. I believe this problem starts at social interaction right after birth. Yeah. Whereas MMR or measles is at least given after nine months of age. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So I don't believe in that at all. Yeah. And why that theory did come up, though it's obviously a wrong theory, is because of what I mentioned earlier, this so-called regressive autism. Mm -hmm. That my child was normal till one year old because he was speaking and mm -hmm. then he stopped speaking. What happened around one year old? Now, this is unfortunately how a lot of research also begins. That let's catch two things happening at the same time. Oh, they must be related somehow. <laughs> That's what happens. And okay, what happens around one year before he started regress, uh, you know, so-called regressing, he was given the vaccine. Oh, so yeah. could there be an association? So I don't think so mm -hmm. at all. So that's about uh, the scene about stem cell. And, you know, this is a very controversial topic. Let mm -hmm. me put it in scientific content uh, mm -hmm. context is that there is no evidence mm -hmm. that stem cells uh, uh, by itself, stem cell therapy by itself helps autism. There is zero mm -hmm. evidence on that. Okay. Some of the people who are doing it, they also have stem cell therapy followed by intensive intervention therapies. Like whatever we mentioned earlier, whatever therapies are being done conventionally across the world. Maybe sensory integration, the combination of all the therapies that we mentioned. There is no research paper which has shown only stem cell, only interventions like we said, mm -hmm. and neither intervention nor stem cell. Okay. Whatever papers have been published for stem cell have always been stem cell along with therapy. Mm, combination. Yeah. So we don't know what works, mm. but we do know that therapy by itself does work. Mm. So there is no proof that stem cell by itself has any additional advantage in at least in autism. I can't comment about the other applications of stem cell. I'm not at all aware about or an expert in those issues. But in autism, I, it has no evidence at all. And neither is ozone therapy or hyperbaric oxygen ah, or various kinds yeah. of so we've published the guidelines in Indian pediatrics in the Journal of Indian Academy of Pediatrics in 2017 as the IAP guidelines and very clearly we've mentioned this that yeah. there is no evidence that any of these therapies are see because it's a chronic problem it doesn't get over quickly there is such a lot of social taboo parents yeah. are devastated depressed yeah. so everybody wants a quick fix and unfortunately yeah, really. some people do try to offer a quick fix for a yeah. uh, perhaps unreasonable amount of money so mm. maybe that's why it goes on yeah yeah uh, yeah very well said yeah and uh, dr samir mentioned about indian academy of pediatrics uh, viewers friends um, uh, this very prestigious uh, our, our academy we feel really proud of that and dr samir is national secretary of uh, iap also. Uh, joint secretary yeah joint secretary sorry and they have wonderful digital IAP platform. In yes. fact, that's the place where, where I heard one of his Dr. Samir's talk. It was so good. Uh, one last question, Samir. Maybe you, Dr. Samir, you have been uh, in this field for almost since 2003, no? Uh, some yes, yes, 18 that's years. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Uh, which is your smallest, earliest pickup of autism and the the uh, other other spectrum also? It was quite delayed, picked up quite late. Youngest one and the so, old pick. Well, oldest, you know, it, there have been people who've gone through life without ever having been, ah, you know, diagnosed okay. as autism. Because, yes, true, true. like we say, we have those children, people who are a little, you know, not very socially active or things like that. Yeah. So that can go on. But I do get a lot of children from school, from primary school, who mm -hmm. come to me with complaints of child is, you know, very destructive in the classroom, not paying attention. And then when you go back in history, yeah. Well, people have suppressed, they, they do not see that the child is a, that problem. They don't recognize it at all. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying that they are lying, but they do not see what they do not wish to see. Correct. And if you go back in the, there's a clear cut history of impaired social interaction, social behavior, speech. Like I said, it comes to light yeah. in the, the pre-primary, it gets covered up because the child is repeating nursery rhymes. The teachers are also happy. Parents are happy. Everybody's happy. But when it comes to understanding communication and behavior with a group bunch of people, yeah. that's when it gets uh, obvious. Mm -hmm. The earliest I would tell you is 
perhaps even eight, nine months, because there is oh. something that comes up, which is joint attention. Mm. So you may not be able to pick up one is to one attention, but by the time the child is 10, 11 months old, if mm. you point out to some things, the mm. child should be able to focus on that with you, especially a book. So when you're going through pictures by the child, by the time the child is 10, 11 months, Hey, look, there's an apple. And the child should be looking at the eye, looking at the picture, looking at you, looking at the book, looking at you, looking at the book. This joint attention, along with you paying attention to a third object or yeah. a third person or a third idea, that is quite easy to pick up because this child may look at you. And then, like I said, that stare may be difficult to judge whether really? it is meaningful or meaningless. But the joint attention definitely is something that you cannot confuse because this yeah. child just does not have that. Yeah. Simple things like then the child will hold your hand and drag you to an object mm. instead of just directly pointing to the object straight away at that age. So all these things would be able to, and we do pick it up that way. Yeah. Yeah. So that reminds and, me. And just one last comment. One last yeah, comment. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter whether you think the child has autism or no. Huh. That's the most beautiful part of my life and my work. Yeah. If you feel that you want your child to do better in social communication, why not? I mean, everybody wants their child to become a CEO and a how is that? That's yes. because you are communicating well yeah. with your team. So yeah. start with getting your child to communicate with you yeah. and not with the mobiles. It yeah. doesn't matter whether your child has a diagnosis or a label. Everybody needs to talk to their children and enjoy. Like you said, a second childhood. That was a very nice term you used. <laughs> you need to do that. Don't bother about labels. Yeah, you're right. Autism has, if you grade from 1 to 10, so many uh, shades or level of uh, effect. Uh, yes. Children are being affected. And some of the symptoms are so early and so mild. If we look into ourselves, sometimes we also give unrelated yes. answers. Sometimes we also yes. don't have proper eye to eye contact. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so you're so right that um, we should embrace and accept these people. And they have slightly from one to 10, maybe they are on the six to seven side. One, maybe one or yes. two. Uh, we all have. We all have. In, yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much, Dr. Sami. Uh, I feel like talking more and more, <laughs> but you have time constraint. I'm sure I, for sure I have become so many visors, the joint attention, the pattern, the purpose, the sound, early pickup, speech is later on, the pattern so early, you told the innate objects, correlation. <laughs> I, yeah, wonderful. I will watch this at least six, seven times. <laughs> I, I wish to thank you because uh, you have such a lovely way of uh, doing this like a conversation. It doesn't yeah. feel like a uh, you know Even interview I, or anything. It feels yeah, like yeah. a conversation, and you are amazing at that because you <laughs> managed to make me completely at ease, and I you know we could discuss it very nicely. Yeah. So thank you so much, and I wish your show a lot of success in the future. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Samir, and uh, viewers. If you have more questions, uh, uh, I can forward. You can. Um, uh, put it on the chat box or uh, put in the comment box. I will forward Dr. Samir. It's okay. I can forward their questions to you. Yes, absolutely. And also thanks to my dear friend, Dr. Sora, because he got ah. us in touch with each other. Yeah. And I watched your uh, show with when you, uh, you had a discussion with him about music as well. So <laughs> thanks to all of you there and my best yes. wishes to all of you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Doc, thank you so much. Dr. Sora is doing a great job here. And we feel so nice and connected to you. And yes, your DIP is fantastic. Beautiful. Thank you, sir. And every day in morning, at least I'm spending 40, 50, 60 minutes. Yeah, Dr. Bakul Parekh, our president, yeah. has been the vision, uh, yeah. the vision behind it. It's a blessing in disguise from COVID. Thank you yes. very much, Dr. Samir. Thank you. Take Thank care you. and stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you. And uh, viewers, yeah, you, won't, you will agree with me. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm not telling anything. He's most one of the most handsome doctors also. <laughs> thank you so With much. That, yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.